The day is, he writes, beginning fair, a cool white morning. Scent of pine wood still fresh with dew comes off the misty upper slopes of Table Mountain, and in the young sunlight over the city mingles with the richer effluvia of fish, cargoes, seaweed, and a warm brine. Milk carts will now be rumbling over the cobbles of the older parts of the city, but soon those same streets will sink back into brightening emptiness. Then, because it is a holiday, there will be no early hawkers in the Cape Coloured and Malay quarter of the District 6. There, as in the town centre, shops and offices will remain closed for the day. She was certainly not a Rosa Luxemburg, let me put it that way. Let's compare her to Helen Susman. Today you would say Cheryl, Cheryl Carolus. Immortality is a street named Sisigul Avenue. In July 1967, the Ryland Civic Association recommended to the city of Cape Town that honor should be given to those persons who have in the past rendered meritorious service in the field of civics. One of these persons was Sissy Gull. So you see, there was a conflict in my mind with this woman. She became the colored people's hope. She became this wonderful god goddess figure. You know, she's the first colored woman to become a lawyer and, uh, and also attended a university. To hear her speaking on the Grand Parade was, was a treat. She had a, a marvelous ability to draw a crowd. From the moment she had turned, it had become urgent to him to signify. He had recognized her at once, not personally, but as a type. Shape of body, look of crushed flowers about the eyes, domesticity. She belonged to a special limited category, the few who immediately flushed through him an accountable sensation and personal excitement. 6th November 1897, a second daughter, Zainunisa, is born to Dr. Abdullah and Mrs. Helen Abdurrahman of 7 Mount Street, Cape Town, now an overgrown field on the fringes of District 6. The property extended into Vich Street with attached cottages and a vast backyard housing the horses, cabs, fodder and a great array of prized poultry housed in special pens. The girls were edu educated privately as there were no senior schools for coloured pupils in Cape Town before 1925. Walking up and down the pathway with their notes, they would recite the historical dates, declensions and other data, often under the watchful eye of their father. The Abdurrahman household was a hive of cultural and political activity. Dr. Abdurrahman served for many years on both the city and provincial councils as councillor for District 6. He was uh, recognised as being the leader in the African People's Organisation and um, I think that he's... he's uh, focus was largely upon the so-called coloured people. The African People's Organisation, APO, established in 1902, worked at achieving coloured advancement, specifically in education and the extension of coloured franchise rights beyond the Cape. In its aims and aspirations, the APO appealed to and was supported largely by a minority coloured elite. Dr. Abdurrahman served as president from 1905 till his death in 1940. Under his leadership, the APO confirmed and entrenched its allegiance to the Cape Liberal tradition of equal rights for all civilized people. Petitions and the promise of colored voter mobilization were the modus operandi of the APO. The APO, of course, was geared uh, to Smuts's, uh, and Herzog, uh, Smuts especially, a united party in the Cape. And so they always sort of uh, uh, got the colored men to vote for the united party. Despite the sectarian interests of the APO, Dr. Abdurrahman was also at the forefront of Indian politics at the Cape. The Cape Malay Association condemned him roundly for leading a deputation to the Viceroy to plead the South African Indian cause. Apart from his medical and council duties, both he and Mrs. Abdurrahman also served on, were patrons and trustees of numerous cultural, welfare and charity organisations. Sissy, like her sister Waradia, 
received most of her education at home from governesses before taking her matric from London University. She was admitted to the University of Cape Town in 1918. In 1919, she interrupted her studies to marry Dr. A. H. Gul, the son of Yusuf and Wahida Gul. She was 22 years old and he, a much older and more sophisticated 33-year-old London-educated doctor. They set up home at 48 Seoul Street. The Gul's, like the Abdurrahmans, were leading members of the Cape Coloured Elite. Sissy's husband, A. H., was president of the Cape Indian Congress. I was 11 years old when Sissy got married to my brother. Sissy was married to my brother sometime in 1919. They were married for a long time. Let me see. Uh, I don't know when they divorced, but I think they were married they were still married in 1936. At the be beginning of 1936, I think they separated. Despite marriage, motherhood and social obligations as hostess to the numerous local and international dignitaries their family entertained, Sissy re-registered at UCT and completed her BA degree in 1932. In 1933, she was the first black woman to be awarded an MA degree in psychology. Intellectually restless, she would continue her studies towards the LLB degree, which she received shortly before her sudden death. So when Sissy was at varsity, there were these bright sparks, and they did go to Sissy's house. And I'm not going to say more, but they had a, a, parties and I think that is where the drinking began. Not Sissy, but my brother. I am afraid that I am slowly going red. Sissy spoke these prophetic words at a public meeting in the City Hall on April 27, 1931. The occasion was a mass protest meeting against the Women's Enfranchisement Act of 1930 and the Franchise Amendment Bill of 1931. These two measures sought to weaken the non-European vote in the Cape by extending the franchise to white women. Sissy's reference to going red placed on record her divergence from the politics of her father. Dr. Abdurrahman blamed the nationalist government for not only driving men to extremes, but also forcing women to speak of starting a red revolution. I do trust, however, that by the time I've finished, Mrs. Gould will also see that the question of whether the Cape Province shall revert to that proud position which it occupied prior to Union is one worth considering and discussing and one which should immediately be brought into the area of practical realities. And Sissy was growing up in a generation that saw the problems in South Africa as a totality. And she was committed to unity amongst all the oppressed in South Africa. And I don't think that um, Dr. Abdurrahman had crossed that kind of threshold. Unlike Dr. Abdurrahman and his generation who believed in the politics of accommodation and petition, the younger generation of educated, professional, coloured intelligentsia espoused a more radical approach. The mid-30s witnessed a passionate flurry of intellectual activity. Numerous clubs like the Trotskyist New Era Fellowship and the Stalinist October Club was established. These organisations, though small, was seen to be crucial to the development of political orientations at the Cape. I think it was most fundamental to the developments that occurred subsequently in South Africa. Uh, amongst the oppressed in South Africa, I think it was probably the most important watershed in their political development. Sissi was drawn towards greater political involvement and action and was a founder of the National Liberation League. An uneasy alliance between the Trotskyist and Stalinist factions 
The NLL aimed at unity between and the liberation of working classes across colour lines. However, like the APO, it remained a primarily coloured organisation with a largely elite support base. My brother Gulam was, um, I think you called it chairman or president, what is it, of the National Liberation League. And he felt that Sissy would attract more people to the movement and he went from what I heard from him he went to Sissy and he offered her the pres the presidency and I think this is the truth yeah I'm not trying to pull a fast one this is the truth as a law and then there was an attraction in the National Liberation League, which was already CP orientated with Laguma, Gomez, and then they were very, very successful in District 6 because we once filled the drill hall and Sissy was the main speaker and Lenin's book, What is to be Done, was the topic for the meeting. Is it topic? Yeah. And the whole acclaimed her, and the people acclaimed her that day. She looked beautiful. Yes, eloquent she was. But it's, it's what she gave the people that day that turned all our heads. Why not for long, but however, she was then rated as um, Joan of Arc of District 6. She joined the National Liberation League and uh, I was, it was colder than African people. And uh, and I was a member of the Communist Party, and we helped her to to uh, get in the election in 1937. So in recognition that the party helped her to get in to the election, she joined the Communist Party. The Cape Times, April 3rd, 1936 reported a fight on the parade at a meeting organized by the Grey Shirts, a pro-Nazi group who were engaged in acts of urban thuggery. Mrs. Z. Gould, the report said, president of the National Liberation League, clambered on the roof of a supporter's motor car, and while the Grey Shirt leader hurled invective at the Jews, she spoke vigorously and eloquently in reply. I was disgusted with his speech and shouted, I will tell you something, and moved away. More than half the crowd followed. I asked two men to lift me up as there was no platform and they placed me on their shoulders. I spoke from there first and then from the hood of a car. It was another occasion when Sissy and Gulam were at the castle side of the parade. The grey shirts. Okay. They, 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 were, they had a meeting on the parade in the middle. I think it was in... The, June, June, July. And Sissy in Gulam got a thorough some booking. We met Sissy, I'm not quite sure how, somebody introduced us to her. And she said, why don't the two of us come and stay with her? She had a room to let. Her uh, previous lover had just left her. And she said she, she was sure that he would come back to her someday. But until he did, there was the room vacant and we could have it. And I was very grateful. She had a lovely house in Friedehook. And we moved in and stayed with her for a year. In early 1936, Sissy and Dr. H. Gould separated. She rented a house in Friedehook and moved in with Sam Khan, a young lawyer and CP member. He would also later serve on the city council. 
It's true, she was a married woman with three children who'd divorced her husband and set up a house on her own and, and took in as a lover uh, a young man who was almost half her age. And it shocked the community, but not nearly as much as it shocked the Jewish community. They were absolutely horrified by this, that there was this promising young legal student, a brilliant chap, and risking his whole career by setting up home with not only a married woman and the mother of three children, and so much older than he, but also a coloured woman. And so both of them were, were challenging all the prevailing preconceptions. In those days, to live openly, you know, the way she did with Sam, I mean, that was too coverage. She, she had coverage. She displayed it. Ray was convinced that the only woman Sam ever truly loved in his whole life was Sissy. And his wife used to complain that, um, that I hurt myself. If Sissy had a problem, she'd always get in touch with Sam, who was a lawyer. He'd also been in Parliament, but he was kicked out. And it didn't matter what time of the day or night she phoned, Sam would always attend to, to anything that she wanted. So he obviously retained very warm feelings for her. The uneasy alliance that constituted the NLL finally surfaced in tensions between the Trotskyist and Stalinist factions. Sissi resigned as president. I think that uh, there was uh, again the, the problem that arose not merely because of what was going on side, uh, inside the National Liberation uh, Movement, the NLL. Uh, I think that what was actually occurring at one and the same time with the events in the Soviet Union, where there was the prosecution of the uh, of 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 the uh, uh, essence, the essential core of the Bolshevik Party by the Stalinist group, and um, there was a division in regard to the kind of support here that people felt for one or the other. I think that. Sissy's a fairly close association with the Communist Party meant that the tendency was to tamp down the very highly critical attitude of, of the Stalinist regime in the Soviet Union, where, as Dr. Gould tended uh, to support those who, uh, whose ideas and perceptions were more closely related to those what is generally called the Trotskyist group. And I think that there was a parting of the ways then insofar as those things were concerned. An anonymous letter published in the Cape Standard of August 23, 1938, made nasty allegations regarding her political unreliability and the use of underhand tactics to drive Dr. Gulam Gul from the organization. Sissy's reply was typically fiery. The statements contained in your correspondence letter are nothing but a pack of lies deliberately fabricated to discredit me and the National Liberation League in the eyes of your readers. His letter deliberately creates the impression that the career of its president has been opportunistic and checkered by the expulsions and resignations from various organizations. That by underhanded and disagreeable methods, I drove Dr. Gould from the presidency. I am prepared to give £100 to any non-European charity if your correspondent can prove that he is a municipal voter in Ward 7. Yours, etc., Mrs. Z. Gould. It was in the drawer where a sister Gulam now was opposing Sissy for the presidency. And then there was a man, I don't know, he was a boxer, I forget his name, whether it was right or bright or sight or something, and he lived in Chester Road, just above Searle Street. And he came when I was uh, heckling Sissy, then he drew the seats apart and he was going to give me a, a good donating up when uh, when Sissy's May beat he sat at the back and got hold of my bun. That that's bad enough to be tackled 
from the side, but to be tackled from the back in a bin. But I just gave her my elbow in her jaw, and I marched arms akimbo to Sissy Spotser, who, who luckily for himself reversed out of my out of the aisle of the church of the chairs. The flame group was divided from within. The majority held that it was no function of the Revolutionary Party to be concerned in municipal politics. The party should overthrow the capitalism and entire system of government which supported it. Participation in elections therefore could amount to no more than bargains with the heron folk, and would be class, historical and revolutionary treachery, nothing short of a sellout, a trading in of all that a group stood for and fought for or as Rycliffe now dramatically announced, a compromise, my friends, black and distasteful. The non-European United Front was formed in 1938 and unlike the NLL, sought to include a broader base of support. Sissy, in her first address as president said, This United Front conference demonstrates the fact that not only are the non-Europeans sadly let down by the government, but also by the coloured organisations in South Africa. No self-respecting non-European would be prepared to submit to such humiliation. We can only combat such measures by relying on ourselves and by uniting into one solid front. They want to spread from national liberation into the unity of the non-white oppression. So that was really the formation of the non-European United Front. In September of 1938, Sissy decided to stand for council election as candidate for Ward 7. She won with an overwhelming majority. In one of her speeches, she said, I can suffer with you. I can understand and appreciate the distinctions that affect you. I am prepared to fight for their removal and the betterment of the working classes. While the threat of war was looming in Europe, the South African government was pressing ahead with its segregationist policies. Sissy's focus at this point, both within council and without, was the issue of segregated housing and other amenities. Both the NLL and the Non-European United Front were at the forefront, organising meetings, marches and petitions, and a committee of action headed by Sissy was formed to directly address the issue of segregation. As before, events in the outside world were to have a direct impact on the ideological alignments and internal wrangling within the NLL, culminating in the expulsion of Dr. Gulam Gul, Laguma and others. This Trotskyist faction would later form the core of the non-European unity movement. Sissi was re-elected as president of the NLL. The immediate point of difference, Laguma was later to explain, was the barring of Europeans from holding executive office in the NLL. Sissi, who had numerous CP friends, was opposed to this. A less apparent point of difference was the issue of non-European participation in the war. I think there were two distinct groups. One, who regarded that there was a patriotic obligation to join in the struggles against Nazism and fascism, and others who regarded the war as being an imperialist war. I think that Sissi had a leg in both camps. Because of her associations with the Communist Party of South Africa, uh, uh, I think she found herself in some way committed to support the position of the S South African Communist Party, particularly after 1941, that is the year in which the Soviet Union was invaded. So the defense of the Soviet Union was a very material thing to people who were associated with the party. She had allied herself with the Communist Party of South Africa and their agendas for change, which shifted very, very rapidly with the war. They first supported the Hitler-Stalin Pact, then they went off the Hitler-Stalin Pact when, uh, when Hitler invaded, and then Stalin suddenly decided, no, we must fight for the socialist fatherland. And, you know, that sort of tactical maneuvers of the Communist Party, that was very much sissy tactical alliances, just shifting the terrain of politics as it suits, suits well. Now this was her politics day to day. Sissy was struggling uh, movements and tendencies 
she had uh, the old idea of non-European unity, national liberation. She was younger then, together with Ulan, with whom she was quite close, and Jane Wu and others. And then uh, came the uh, war period, and then she did associate herself with the, 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 the Stalinists. I think that, that uh, Sissy might not have been regarded, if one is to be fair, as being a very dogmatic member of the Communist Party. I don't think that she was a committed Stalinist. I think that a lot of her friends and close associates, I mean, family and so on, excluded, were in the Communist Party of South Africa. And I think that Sissy uh, was a very good propagandist whose talents I think could be used by any progressive movement at the time. Within the Communist Party circles, she was regarded with a good deal of, of suspicion. And whilst recognizing her, um, her drawing power and her popularity and her value as a, as a figurehead, people didn't trust her political judgment and they didn't trust her um, motivations. And they felt that she was, she was an opportunist in that she would go whichever the wind blew. When I'm saying that, it must be clear that she wouldn't have ever gone over to the other side and nobody ever suspected her of doing that. But within the opposition, as you say, there were many groupings. And she would veer from one to another, depending on where she could get most, most return for, her, for herself as a personality. And that was recognized, but it was accepted because of her value as a public figure. She took a lot of her political lines from Sam, I think, although she always claimed that she was the one who had trained him because he was the younger one and she was more experienced. And there was, there was possibly an interchange between the two of them, but he always followed the party line. And um, I think that uh, Broadly speaking, she did too, but never as unquestioningly as all the rest of us who were members. She, she was prepared and did, on many occasions, take an independent line. She had been having considerable difficulty absorbing many of the tenets of Marxism, and she was much too sincere to answer uncertainty with a faroga of slogans and dogma. She was a Marxist less out of conviction than by association, and she was anxious to introduce Henry to the Rycliffs so as to sort out her own hesitating allegiances. I'd say I'd put it this way, that uh, she was absolutely and irrevocably opposed to the oppression and the discrimination that prevailed in South Africa. But I. I never con could convince myself that she had a coherent political philosophy. I think that um, uh, she, it, it would also be wrong to describe her simply as an opportunist, but uh, I think that wherever she found it, an opportunity to oppose what was going on in South Africa here and to deepen people's understanding of things, I think she was prepared to contribute in her way. Sissy Gould used to, we used to ask her occasion to come and talk to us on city council issues. And that's about as far as we could stretch her. So as I, as I said, she found it was necessary to be aligned with this tendency now, more radical. But she still had a sort of um, elastic thing pulling her, occasionally pulling her leg back to the uh, other side, not to her father's side, not to the APO. To describe her as a tool, I think, I think would be unfair. I think that she was a very useful person to have around. And uh, I think that in whatever she attempted to do, is in, in whatever uh, I, I, I got to know her about, I think it was done with a certain measure of sincerity. Um, I don't think that her status was that of somebody who could be used in that way. Sissy knew exactly what she was doing as long as Sissy was the prima donna. 
Sissy was willing. She wasn't a blind follower of any party line. She was an independent woman, an independent thinker. Throughout her 25 years on the council, issues of public health, welfare, education and equal amenities for coloured people were her main concern. She served on numerous committees dealing with issues ranging from trade licences to child welfare. But her special focus was on public health and she served as chair of this and the dental clinic's special committee at various times. Despite her political and personal differences with her father, Councillor Zedgu was treading the same political path as he. By the time of his death in February 1940, Sissy had assumed the public and political mantle of her father. Cape Town sees the passing of one of the most prominent coloured men in the country, Dr. Abdurrahman. Hundreds of mourners attend the funeral, which is carried out according to Muslim rites, and among those present are the mayor and city councillors, many groups of coloured school children, and members of the city fire brigade. Born in Cape Town, Dr. Abdurrahman took his medical degree at Glasgow University. When he returned to South Africa, he became the first coloured man to enter the city and provincial council. He served on the city council from 1903 and on the provincial council from 1919. On the city council, he was, at various times, chairman of 14 different committees. His energies were always directed to bettering the lot of the coloured people, and for 33 years, up to the time of his death, he was president of the African People's Organization. With the death of Dr. Abdurrahman, the colored community of South Africa loses a great leader. When she went into local politics, her ethnic background, her father's uh, clientelistic politics became her. She became that person. She took over the role of what old man Abdurrahman would have stood for. He had his particular little thing in Khotis and that area, she carved a little niche for herself in District 6. And then her role in the City Council, I think, also set a, a, a direction for a number of the other people who were along with her in the City Council. Now, the vigour with which she prosecuted that work in pursuit of, of, of her opposition to discrimination, unfairness, injustice in society, and so on, uh, was something that was quite admirable. On the other side, of course, you had her work as a councillor in the district. And uh, here then, you had the hawkers, the men, the barrels, and she always had to be on their side to defend them against the attacks by the council officials. Now, Sissy came in on that because the whole of District 6, you can say, everybody had a barrel and they were all hawkers, and of course, they also were the basis of the coolness. Her politics shifted, and local council politics was what? Group Areas Act, renaming of, rezoning, even knows what? I mean, you know, what was she fighting for in the council? I mean, you know, if I want to ask a question in retrospect, like, what did she actually achieve? I mean, we could have a dialogue about this. I actually don't know. What do you think? She was amongst those who achieved, say, uh, little things like the appointment of traffic cops of colour here, and uh, at one stage uh, getting the city council to train people in areas which had, from which so-called non-white children had been excluded. Um, but uh, the, the criticism is always directed at individuals who have been working in these local councils that their interests are, are sectarian in the sense that um, the majority of the people whose complaints were before the city council and some of the persons who were classified as coloured. I don't think that she consciously worked to promote that kind of, uh, of, of discrimination. I think that uh, her, her attention, I think, was directed at the interest of all concerned here but within the framework of this local kind of situation. I don't think that she championed the education issue. That's a kind of call. Mm. I think it's very general. But uh, she was these community-based structures and organizations mm -hmm. that she was in. There were such things like uh, the hospitals and uh, care of babies and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. 
anything because the council also had uh, the uh, hospitals there, Somerset, mm -hmm. and um, there was the other one where I went to uh, infectious diseases mm -hmm. hospitals mm -hmm. and so on. So that she was involved on various committees. I know she's in various committees. As city councillor and politician, Sissy's support base crossed colour and class boundaries. Her special appeal, however, was with women and particularly mothers and housewives who identified with the issues she focused on. Definitely the uh, constituency of the District 6, which was a melange of classes. It was fragments of, of classes, working class people, new immigrants, Jews, uh, Asians, whatever. It was a very hodgepodge type of community. And this community itself was very poor. I mean, the fact that the matter is, and this is not a sexist comment, I think that generally in, in, in oppressed communities, the women folk are more dedicated to the basic interests of the, of, 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 and concerns of the family. So that there was that kind of, I, I would say, um, inevitable uh, um, synergies between her and the people uh, to whom she was addressing her, her problems. Women were, and I suppose to some extent housewives, because she did take up issues of uh, prices and food as a counsellor, every time as a counsellor. If one understands it in the American middle class feminist way, yes, she was a new woman. She represented a type of feminism that I think young, liberated South African women can identify with. Dearest Mummy, tonight we resist and tomorrow we shall be behind prison bars. But we are resolute and determined to go. I have been an inspiration to thousands and it would be moral cowardice to shirk what I have urged others to do. Don't worry about us. We will never have an unhappy moment. The term of imprisonment will be bearable compared with much I have suffered in my life. I'm sure you will appreciate that. Soon I shall be home for a rest. Outside it is raining and I am somewhat heavy with asthma. I hope it lifts. Give my love to inquiring friends and tell them all that I shall go to prison with determination and courage in my heart it is for the greatest cause, the fight for liberty. Look after yourself. Love, Sissy. The 1946 Asiatic Act authorised the removal of Indian people from the established business and residential areas. Mass meetings and protest marches were organised all over South Africa. Sissy was elected Vice Chairwoman of the Cape Passive Resistance Council. In July, a group of passive resistors led by Sissy left for Durban to give active support to the movement. In August, she was arrested for trespassing. She was fined three pounds or 30 days imprisonment. Tragedy struck while she was in prison and her youngest son, Shaheen, committed suicide. Shaheen, the youngest one, uh, did away with his own life. Uh, this happened at a time when uh, there was some relationship with a young lady at the university. Her students. He was apparently rejected by her. Sissy was in in jail in Durban when her son committed suicide. Sissy complained, and I was there to my brother that Shaheen had climbed the uh, a pine tree. Somebody said it was a stone pine tree. You know those ones with the big denable. And he had threatened Sissy that if she didn't stop nagging at him and shouting at him, then he would commit. So I think he was one of those people. There are people who toy and play with this idea of suicide. And in the book, the Rubaiyat of Umakayam, there is a poem that says, when death offers you, when death 
proffers you the drink. Do not shrink. And this was underlined by Shalit. The National Party victory in 1948 speeded up the process of erosion of coloured rights in the Cape. Sissi was elected chairman of the Franchise Action Committee that was formed in 1951 in reaction to the separate representation of voters' bill. On April 7, 1951, thousands went on strike in Cape Town. The non-European people have again and again reiterated their determination to fight the bill uncompromisingly and their magnificent response to our strike call is conclusive proof of their outraged feelings and their willingness to make sacrifices in the struggle for their rights. She became, in a certain sense, from that point of view, a bit of an icon in that period. She would work up people's feelings against this injustice of having to go and sit in compartments there where you had these blunkers, Aliyam and so on, etc. And the Train Apartheid Resistance Committee used the, uh, the, the, the slogan, talk. And this is what you always ended up with in a very dramatic fashion. Uh, I don't know where the Puerta later on got it from her. And she said to the people there, if you meet people who say they know nothing about it, then just tell them, talk, and get them to understand what this is all about. <laughs> well, I should say that she certainly had a lot of acting ability. The 1950s witnessed increased repression with various measures that illegitimized public meeting and other forms of protest. Undaunted, Sissy continued her vociferous fight against segregation. In June 1952, she was unseated from the council for failing to pay her rates by the due date. In a later by-election, she was returned to council unopposed. In October 1954, Sissy received notification that under the 1950 Suppression of Communism Act, she had been listed or named as a communist. While this had effectively displaced Sam Khan from council and was cause for grave concern for Sissy herself, it did not seriously jeopardize her career as councillor. The special branch tried to uh, established that she was a communist and in that way they could unseat her from, from city council and they came to ask me and I said I don't remember her being in the party and, uh, and I was known for my good memory so it was a, a great joke that I, I don't remember Sisi being in the party. I ever Sisi enjoyed it very much and she was glad that I had saved her. In 1960 came Sharpeville and the state of emergency. And um, they first picked up all the people who were on the Congress committees. So as a result of that, I was the only white person. And then there was another swoop of arrests, and they arrested people who'd been even vaguely involved, particularly people who were listed. And it was in that second wave that people like Sissy was picked up because she had been, she must have been listed, in fact she must have been a member of the party because they wouldn't have picked her up otherwise. We went on a hunger strike because we heard that the men in the Worcester prison were on a hunger strike and we got somehow to know that about that and we decided to support them. So I had to convey to Sissy that we were on a hunger strike. And so, and of course the wardress was there watching us, we weren't allowed to talk to her. So I said, as I passed, I walked up and down, I said, Ramadan, Ramadan, Ramadan. She said, what the hell are you talking about, Ramadan, Ramadan? I said, mm, we're not eating. So she got the, she said, you mean Yom Kippur?
On the evening of July 3rd, Sissy suffered a stroke. She died at Groteskir Hospital the following morning. It's not customary among Muslim women to attend funerals, I believe. But these women, well, we, I drove with a few of my friends and comrades in the car. We were following the hearse. It was an enormous funeral. Her body was taken from her ex-husband's home in, I think, Mountain Road. That's where we went. And then there was this procession and there was a guard of honour from the firemen, you know, with their helmets. You know. And I think most of the councillors attended. On 3rd July 2001, the University of Cape Town commemorated Sissy Gould by naming a plaza in her honour. Sissy Gould's life indicates a break from an exclusive past pattern, a creative engagement which challenges facing societies and constant striving for excellence. She was a vibrant person and the student plaza has been chosen as a fitting honour and a true embodiment of Sissy's spirit. She represented a new type of woman. The woman without the pudder, the woman in the English suits, the one who was... I mean, she portrayed herself. Her own self-image must have been a sissy that she created for herself. And it got nothing to do with her politics. She was what I would call, and, and I think this is something that I've not defined uh, very accurately for myself, she was a, a, a very important vector for ideas during that period. I think one can say that she was a very active fighter against apartheid. Uh, without going into the minutiae of, you know, tactics one or tactics the other, and who did she ally herself with the unity front or did she oppose them? Broadly speaking, I would say that she was an important leading figure in the struggle against apartheid. In, in those years, the only outstanding person, woman personality, and even among the white women or any of the women here, was Sissy. There's not one Sissy Ghoul. There are many Sissies, depending on who writes the history, who interprets what she's doing, and Sissy's own interpretation of her own role. That is something we have to look at. How did she perceive herself?